Hello and welcome to the Friends of Medieval Dublin YouTube channel. I'm Anya Foley and today we will be looking at the medieval water course of Dublin City. So if this interests you, please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell if you haven't done so already. And don't forget to like and share the video. During the first half of the 13th century, the city of Dublin had been using the River Poddle as a water supply, but as the city grew, this was becoming insufficient for its needs. Not only was the city in need of water, but so were the churches and monasteries in the vicinity, particularly St Thomas's Abbey to the west of the city. St Thomas's Abbey was at least partly responsible for the maintenance of the watercourse of the city and perhaps its construction as well. Two thirds of the water from the Abbey's watercourse was diverted to the Abbey, while the other one third was for the use of the citizens of Dublin. The source of the Poddle is located in modern day Tymon Park in southwest County Dublin and it flowed into the city via Kimmage and Harrell's Cross. The Tymon River, which rises in Cookstown near Talla, also feeds into the Poddle River. The name changes once it flows through Tymon Park. Closer to the city, the river originally wound around St Pat Patrick's Church, later Cathedral, but in the late 12th century it was channelled into two artificial water courses. Both ran northwards along Patrick Street, powering mills along their path before emptying into the city foss. The River Poddle did not have a sufficient supply of water to power all the mills in Dublin's western suburbs. This was not only an issue for St Thomas's Abbey, but also for the other mill owners in the vicinity. The Hospital of St John the Baptist had a mill, as did some of the citizens of Dublin. The King also had mills at Dublin Castle. The city had to come up with a solution to overcome the shortage and on the 29th of April 1244, the Justiciar of Ireland, Mars Fitzgerald, ordered the Sheriff of Dublin to impanel a jury to decide the best place to divert water from the River Dodder into the city. It was decided that water would be diverted at Balrodery Weir through an open aqueduct. The sluice gates at Balrodery Weir, where the water was diverted from the river, still exist and water flowed through this channel until at least the end of the 20th century, but it is no longer in use, perhaps because of the construction of the M50, another urban development. The open aqueduct from Balrodery Weir flowed towards Templo Castle, which was not far from Templo Church. The church still stands today, though the castle is long gone, replaced by the 18th century Temple Oak House, though some of the fabric of the medieval castle does survive. During the mid-16th century, the castle was held by the Talbot family and they controlled the water course. One of the most famous members of the family was Richard Talbot, who was the second justice of the common bench during Elizabeth I's reign. After Temple Oak House was built, the Domville family lived there. They added ornamental water gardens with ponds and cascades in the mid-18th century. A part of the stone structure of one of the ornamental features still survives. This section of the watercourse going towards Temple Oak Castle was entirely artificial, while sections of the Poddle River were used in Perry's Town and Kimmich. Though much of the Poddle is now underground, especially closer to the city, sections near Tymon Park, Poddle Park and Mount Argus Park are still overground. There were also mills located along these sections of the Poddle, including one at Poddle Park and another close to the Super Value located on the Sundrive Road. At Kimmage, in what is now Mount Argus Park, this increased volume of water was divided by a cut water called a tongue or the stone boat, and a second canal was built here. The water was then conveyed via Dolphin's Barn to a reservoir that must have been located close to the site of the modern city basin. The water was drawn from this reservoir through Thomas Street to the city conduit, which was located close to St Michael's Church. Additional water was supplied from the Coombe Stream also known as the Commons Water. It originated in Drimna and flowed east through the Coombe Valley. 
An excavation conducted in 2003 in the Coombe by Melanie McQuaid revealed that this area had been continuously occupied from the 12th century up to the present time. An artificial channel that was constructed by the canons of St Thomas's Abbey to divert water from the Coombe stream was found during the course of the excavation and this dated to the late 12th century. There was a gradual infilling of this channel between the 13th and the 15th centuries. Excavations also revealed that a wattle fence was constructed along the length of the channel during the 13th or 14th centuries. The excavation did not reveal any evidence of medieval dwelling houses on this site, therefore it appears to have maintained its rural character until the modern period. According to M. V. Ronan, the Commons water powered the malt mill located at the western end of the Coombe. On the 18th of November 1245, the Justiciar John Fitzgeoffrey was ordered by King Henry III to supply water to Dublin Castle from the city's conduit. A decade after water from the conduit was diverted to the castle, some of the citizens were also granted the right to divert some of the water for their own personal use. In 1308, John Ledeser, a merchant who served as mayor of Dublin on multiple occasions, paid for the construction of a public fountain in Corn Market. It is likely that St Thomas's Abbey also diverted their water course at around this time. Before 1243, because the stream powering the Abbey's mills flowed through the parish of St. Patrick's, it meant that the canons of the Cathedral of St. Patrick's could claim tides on any mills that were constructed there. There is no evidence of St. Patrick's getting any revenue from these mills after 1243, and it was probably at this time that the Abbey diverted the water of the paddle just south of Harold's Cross and brought it through their own lands. The monks of St Thomas seem to have been very deliberate about the location of this stream. Miles V. Ronan believed that it was brought through lands carefully surveyed to ensure that there were suitable falls to help drive the abbey's mills. He also speculated that the artificial stream was built where it was to form a landmark and prevent the mayor and citizens from encroaching on the abbey's lands. In other words, it also operated as a boundary. He also believed that this section of the stream was artificial in nature because the section running through the Abbey's lands was never called a paddle, but was known as the Abbey Mill Stream. And even after the suppression of the Abbey, this part of the stream was called the Earl of Mead's Watercourse. The watercourse wound its way around the Abbey's lands. To start with, it supplied water for the mill pond at Wood Mill. From there, it went in a northwest direction, crossing over Cork Street until it almost met the city watercourse. It then flowed northeast down Marabo Lane and at Pimlico, it turned in a southeast direction down RD Street, supplying Malt Mill. It continued southeast to the double mills, filling its mill pond before joining the old watercourse, flowing northeast towards the city foss. Maintaining this water course was important, as it was the city's supply of water throughout the medieval period. The water course was vital to the prosperity of the city. It was not only important as a source of drinking water, it also powered the industries in the locality. It was most obviously important for the brewing industry. Long before Arthur Guinness set up shop at James's Gate in the 18th century, Brewing was carried out in this area, both on an industrial and personal scale. The Abbey of St. Thomas has especially profited from local brewing activities, since they had been granted one-tenth of the profits of all ale brewed in the city by King John. The area between Newgate and Kilmainham was also popular for pottery makers, so much so that a street close to St. James's Church became known as Croker's, i.e. Crockery Lane. Other industries that sprung up in the vicinity included food production, glass making, tanning and tile making, and a constant supply of water would have been vital for all these activities, not only in their production, but also to put out fires that might occur during the manufacturing process. 
Some of the water, for example, was diverted to Cook Street, where much of the city's food production took place, and obviously an area that was prone to fires going out of control. Some of the citizens of Dublin were responsible for the maintenance of the watercourse, and parcels of land were granted out specifically to generate income to maintain the watercourse. In 1337, Thomas Falcon paid rent of half a mark of silver for a plot of land in St Nicholas Street. This money was earmarked to maintain the common conduit of the watercourse. When William Marshall was granted property between St Thomas's Abbey and the city cistern in 1320, it was on the condition that he would maintain the city watercourse between the abbey and this cistern. The most important function of the watercourse was to power the mills and both the citizens of the city and the various religious institutions around the city, especially St. Thomas's Abbey, jealously guarded their rights over this water supply. The mills of St. Thomas's Abbey played a vital role in its economy, as they did on any manorial estate. The Abbey possessed mills not only for the grain they produced themselves, but their tenants would have been expected to mill their grain in these mills too. Therefore, they were an extremely valuable financial resource. The Abbey's earliest mills, as I've already mentioned, were probably located in the parish of St. Patrick, but were moved when the Abbey changed the route of its watercourse in the mid-13th century. An inquisition taken in August 1552 after the death of William Brabazon, who was granted the lands of St. Thomas after the dissolution, offers us a revealing glimpse of the extent of the Abbey's possessions, particularly in the city's western suburbs. It reveals that the Abbey had a number of mills here. Two mills, called the double mills, were located at Warren Mount. In Brabazon's Inquisition, it reveals that the double mills came with sufficient pasture for leading horses. Did this mean that one of the double mills was a horse mill? Or did the double in the name indicate that the mill had a dual purpose? There is certainly evidence for horse mills in medieval Dublin. Abbey Cryer Hall excavated a horse mill at Hammond Lane, and St Mary's Abbey also had a horse mill. So a horse mill at St Thomas's Abbey would have certainly been conceivable. Horse mills may have been used during times of drought, or perhaps there was not enough water at the location of the double mills to power two water mills. The wood mill was located at Greenmount at Harold's Cross at the southern edge of the Liberty of St Thomas and Denor, and the fourth mill located in the Abbey's Liberty at the time of its dissolution was called Le Malt Mill. The cannons may have used malted grain to make alcohol. It is possible that each mill had a different function. Le Malt Mill may have been used to mill barley, since it was the most common kind of grain used in the production of alcohol. The malt mill is not mentioned in the sources until 1544, therefore it might be relatively late. The malt mill suggests that not only did the abbey receive ale and mead from citizens of Dublin, they also manufactured it themselves. It is also conceivable that brewers who held their lands of the abbey used this mill. The complaints made by the abbey about the citizens of Dublin not paying their tall ball, that is, a proportion of the ale made in the city that King John granted to the Abbey may have been the incentive behind the Abbey producing their own ale, though it is likely that they all, always produced a proportion of their own ale. When the mayor and citizens of Dublin did a preambulation of the city's boundaries, known as the riding of the franchises, they had to cross over the mill pond located between the Coombe and Dolphin's Barn. This was probably the mill pond associated with the double mills. When the boundaries of the city were defined in a grant made by John, Lord of Ireland, in 1194, there is no mention of this pond. The mill pond is, however, mentioned during subsequent accounts of the riding of the franchises in 1324, 1527 and 1603. Therefore, there was a mill in this vicinity by the first quarter of the 14th century. The mills were occasionally mentioned in court records. Naturally, the grain produced by the mills was attractive to thieves, either for their own consumption or to sell on to a third party. 
An unpublished court record from the 13th of October 1316 reveals the kind of punishment a thief could expect. Dublin. Thomas Hurt accused of by night breaking into the mill of the Abt of St. Thomas the Martyr near Dublin in Lacombe and stealing therefrom three bushels of wheat and flour were two shillings a bushel and of being a common thief of pigs, sheep and divers other thefts comes and says that he's not guilty and puts himself upon the country and John Forrester, John Pope, Lawrence DeLay, Simon de Schillingford, Walter de Salter Salmon, William Ulf, Richard Colchester, Morris Outlaw, William Prodom, David Hull and Thomas de Choro, jurors, say that he is guilty, therefore let him be hanged. He has no chattels and no free land. Hurt's punishment seems unduly harsh for the theft of some grain, but it was in fact typical of the time. However, in another case from 1306, when Alan the Baker seriously assaulted the abbot's miller, there was a much different outcome. Alan, who was Thomas de Sinterby's servant, was caught by Hugh, the abbey's miller, opening the sluices to provide more water to his lord, to the detriment of the abbey. The miller attempted to arrest Alan, but Alan struck the miller on the head with a stone concealed in his glove, and Hugh fell on the ground, half dead. The abbot, Richard Sweetman, was not willing to let Alan away with this attack on his servant, and he allegedly assaulted him on the highway close to the abbey and imprisoned him in the abbey's prison. In spite of almost killing Hugh, Alan brought the abbot to court for false imprisonment, and in response he was charged with making a false claim against the abbot. However, in this case, the Snitterby and Sweetman were able to resolve the matter between themselves. The water course for the city of Dublin was vital to the continued prosperity of the city and the various religious institutions surrounding it. The Abbey of St. Thomas has probably played a key part in the construction and maintenance of the water course and it continued in use for several centuries, long after the Abbey ceased to be. In fact, it was the city's main water source until 1775. Even after the water ceased to be used for drinking, mills, breweries and other industries continued to use the water course. By the 19th century, the puddle was described as an immense sewer and extremely polluted by paper making, so much so that cattle and horses died from drinking the poisonous water. I think this photo gives a sense of how easy it would have been to contaminate the water with all the buildings so close to it while it was still left open. Today, most of the river is underground closer to the city, but open stretches in Kimmich and Temple Oak hint at its importance in the med to the medieval city. Thank you for watching the video and don't forget to like and share. If you're interested in following Friends of Medieval Dublin on social media, all the links are in the description box below.